Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Marlene Prieto was embroidering a picture. It turned out quite beautifully, a warm summer landscape, calm waters, a lake, trees, green grass, all illustrating majestic nature. The woman glanced out the window, and there was the exact same scene. That's why Marlene decided to embroider this particular picture. It had been her hobby for a long time, since her daughter Katerina moved to the city. The woman was already in her 70s, living alone in her ancestral home in the village. Here, it was sunny all summer, and in autumn, the ground was adorned with colorful maple leaves. Everything delighted the eyes, but living alone was boring for Marlene. There used to be neighbors, but now some have passed away, others were taken to the city by their children, and some grandchildren only visited in the summer to sunbath. It wasn't frightening, there was just nothing to occupy her time. The entire house sparkled with cleanliness, there was enough food for a week, and the apple trees in the garden bore fruit. Marlene terribly missed her daughter, Katerina. She had moved away many years ago, went to college in the city, completed her studies, and started an independent life. Initially, she visited her mother almost every week, then once a month, then a year, and eventually, her daughter stopped visiting altogether. Katerina had her own children and her own life. Marlene knew almost nothing about her, and she had seen her grandchildren only a few times in her entire life. How were they doing? Were they healthy? Did they need help? Marlene thought about it every time she went to sleep. But there was not a single message from Katerina. Another July has arrived. Summer was in full swing, and many neighbors came here for vacation with their children. Who wouldn't come to the countryside if there's such weather? The lake was right outside the window. Only Katerina didn't come with her children here. Marlene invited her daughter and her grandchildren many times, but they refused, saying they were busy or had vacationed elsewhere. The older grandchild had been to the countryside only once, when he was two years old. Marlene hadn't seen him since, and Marta, the younger one, not at all, she was now a year old. What were they up to? What were their personalities like? These questions would remain unanswered, but Marlene didn't despair. During the summer, she had someone from the younger generation to talk to. Next door lived a wonderful family with a child. Alfredo was only six years old, and they often invited Marlene to their house as a babysitter. The parents were happy to spend time alone, and the woman stayed alone with this lovely boy. He was truly a wonderful, smart child. For his age, he knew a lot, counted to ten, and could read. When his parents stayed out late, Marlene would tell him different tales to help the boy fall asleep. Alfredo loved Marlene. She became a substitute grandmother he never knew, as unfortunately, his own grandmother had passed away before he was born. Marlene handled this role beautifully. Marlene, do you have a daughter or a son? Alfredo once asked this poignant question in the evening when his parents were late again. They were drinking coffee on the porch, where the soft light of a floor lamp shone and the full moon illuminated them. Fireflies could be seen in the grass. Alfredo often chased after them, trying to catch them in a jar, but all attempts were unsuccessful, and the boy gave up. Marlene looked out the window and pondered. The boy made her doubt again. Did she really have a daughter? They haven't communicated properly in about ten years. In such a case... Could she be considered a daughter? Of course, I have one, the woman calmly replied, smiling. She was rocking in her chair, gazing at the moon, her legs fully wrapped in a blanket. The loud chirping of crickets could be heard. Who? Alfredo persisted. A daughter, her name is Katerina. She's a very kind woman. Why haven't I seen her? She doesn't come here. Why? I don't know why. If I knew, I'd tell you. Maybe I'm just not interesting to her. How can a mom not be interesting? You're too little, Alfredo, but you ask very smart questions. You know, sometimes parents and their children don't understand each other. It's like they live on different planets, so children distance themselves from their parents because they have completely different views on life. 
I don't understand you, the boy confessed, lowering his gaze. He seemed very upset. Sometimes, I don't understand myself, Alfredo. But know that you're a very clever boy, and someday you'll remember my words. I'll never abandon my mom, the boy said firmly, with a hint of resentment. That's right. Your mom is the most precious thing in life. She brought you into this world, she nurtures you, and gives you everything she can. Marlene, Alfredo began and hesitated a bit, I'll never abandon you either. Do you want me to be your child? I'll always be by your side. The woman laughed, and the boy rushed into her arms. Marlene saw a tear rolling down Alfredo's cheek. You're the best son, she encouraged him. The boy smiled in response and then laughed. Half an hour later, his parents came home. They thanked the woman for her services and invited her for coffee, but she declined, saying it was time for her to sleep and for Alfredo too. It was almost 11 p.m., and even in the summer, it's better to maintain some sleep routine. Marlene returned home and immediately laid down in bed. She was very tired. After all, she had been with Alfredo from morning till late evening today. They went to the lake, played in the garden, and afterward, tired, drank coffee. The woman loved such fulfilling days. They gave her a taste of life. She felt young again, although in her 70s, she wasn't at the most active age. Alfredo awakened in her a desire to live. She could dedicate her remaining life to raising this little boy. The next day, the woman, as usual, was spending time with the child. His mother was preparing lunch, and his father had gone fishing, so they once again asked for Marlene's help. However, this time it was no longer a whim of the parents. Alfredo genuinely wanted to spend time with her. Alfredo, is it you again? The woman enthusiastically exclaimed, approaching the boy and hugging him. It's me, Marlene, let's go to the garden. Mom said there's a lot of strawberries there, the boy laughed. With pleasure. In my garden, strawberries are also growing, we can pick some. Later, I'll make jam. When you come to visit me in the winter, we'll indulge in this wonderful treat together. They spent about 20 minutes picking strawberries in Alfredo's yard, and when the last berry was placed in the basket, Marlene suggested gathering some at her place. Of course, it was smaller in size, but strawberry bushes occupied a significant part of the garden. The woman often made jam from the berries. Here she also grew honeysuckle, raspberries, and gooseberries. Suddenly, Marlene noticed that Alfredo kept looking back all the time. It seemed suspicious. What did you see there, Alfredo? The woman asked, gathering berries. Oh, I saw some people there, walking around your house. What if they're bandits? The boy replied, his voice filled with fear. He looked back again. This intrigued and frightened Marlene. She quietly stood up and slowly approached the place where people were gathering. She couldn't see clearly, but she noticed the outline of a woman holding a child nearby. This calmed her down. After all, a woman couldn't do anything terrible, and the neighbors were nearby. Marlene confidently walked towards these uninvited guests. However, as she got closer and recognized a familiar face, she was shocked. It was her daughter, Katerina, with her children. Now the woman has quickened her pace even more. She couldn't believe that all of this was really happening. They hadn't seen each other in ten years. Katerina? Marlene called out to the woman. Of course, she turned around. She held a baby in her arms and smiled. Mom! Katerina exclaimed and rushed into her mother's arms. It's been so many years. Mom, how happy I am to see you. Katerina, my dear, Marlene rejoiced at her daughter's visit. She was crying with joy. It was all so unexpectedly overwhelming. Alfredo joined them, clearly not understanding who all these people were or what they were doing here. Alfredo, do you remember when I told you about my daughter? So, this is her, Katerina, Marlene explained to the boy. Oh, the one who abandoned you? The boy skeptically asked. Marlene got angry at her impoliteness, saying such things in front of Katerina. What nonsense it was. 
but then she reminded herself that he was just a little child. They quickly brushed off that comment. As they entered the house, Alfredo got acquainted with Teodoro, and Marlene rushed to boil the kettle. Meanwhile, Katerina was sitting on a chair near the table, cradling her infant close and surveying the house. Nothing has changed here since then, she concluded. The same walls, the same dishes. How pleasant it is to return to childhood. Katerina was watching her mother pour coffee into mugs. The children had already found something to do, examining various wooden figurines. Alfredo was trying to explain something about these creations, but being only six years old, it looked quite amusing. A six-year-old was describing a geometric shape and attempting to make it sound as scientific as possible to a five-year-old boy. Finally, Marlene served the coffee and sat down at the table across from her daughter. She couldn't take her eyes off her. Katerina had dyed her hair, changed her hairstyle, and even altered her clothing style. She was barely recognizable. My dear, it's been so long since I last saw you, Marlene said, examining her daughter. What's new? Any news? Please tell me everything. I can't bear it any longer. We haven't seen each other in ten years. Can you believe it? Katerina smiled took a sip of coffee, and only then began her story. Well, there's nothing particularly new. Now I live with Acacio, raise the kids, work, and am terribly tired. Did you receive a letter about Katerina's birth? She pointed to the baby in her arms. How is it going with Acacio? Everything's good in your marriage, right? You've been together for five years, right? Has your ex-husband stopped causing trouble? And how's my Olivia? Oh, I haven't seen her in so long. Olivia is fine, Katerina smiled. This year she's finishing university, she's dating someone, and soon she'll make me a grandmother and you a great-grandmother. Olivia was Katerina's eldest daughter from her first husband, while these two young ones were born during her second marriage. Well, her daughter added, that's not so important. The main thing is that we finally met. I missed you so much. And I missed you too, my dear. Have you come here for the entire summer? Finally, Teodoro can swim in our lake. Actually, Katerina began with intrigue. I came here not just for that. Yes, of course, I wanted to visit you first and show you the kids, but there's another reason. What is it? Marlene was listening attentively to every word. She absorbed each phrase her daughter uttered like a sponge, knowing that she might not hear anything from her daughter for a very long time, or maybe never again. Her time on this earth was limited. We're facing financial problems. Acacio got cut at work, and I'm on maternity leave. We just don't have enough money. Money? Oh, of course, dear, I'll lend you some, Marlene said, waving her hand. She stood up from the chair, went to the living room, and began frantically searching for something in the cabinet. Katerina understood what she was looking for and stopped her, saying, No, Mom, I don't need your money. Marlene turned around, looking at her questioningly. I don't need your money, Katerina repeated calmly, gesturing for her to come back. Marlene sat down next to her, but now she was confused. She really didn't understand what her daughter wanted. In reality, money is precisely what we need, but not the kind you save, much more than that. And I know another way to get it. But I need your help, Katerina explained. Well, tell me, her mother replied with interest. Do you know about child benefits? I do. Then you know that they can give me money for specific expenses, children's education, expensive medical treatment, and so on. Unfortunately, our situation is such that I need to somehow provide for the family. But what the state allocates is non-cash, meaning I can only spend it on something specific. So, recently, my acquaintances suggested to me a way to cash out these funds. It's all perfectly legal, and many people do it. Katerina paused. Well, go on, don't drag it out, Marlene urged her. She was already terribly curious about what her daughter would say. I can supposedly buy real estate from relatives. They will give me money for that. Do you get it? 
Of course, I won't actually pay you anything, but according to the documents, I will be the owner of this house and will also divide it among my children. Do you want to buy my house? Marlene became nervous. Where would she live then? What would happen to her? Did her own daughter want to kick her out? Yes, Katerina nodded, but don't worry. Of course, the house will still be yours, nothing will change. I don't need it, I need the money the government will provide. And you will continue to live here as you did, just not as the owner on paper. That's all. Marlene started thinking about it. On the one hand, it sounded like a very ingenious scheme, but somewhat fraudulent. What if they were exposed? It worried her. Although, who would be bothered by this? Who needed a house in some forgotten village with an old woman in it? So the woman decided to agree. After all, it's her own daughter, and now she needed help. Moreover, it wasn't complicated. She should have just signed some documents. What difference did it make in whose property the house will be? Especially since it was her own flesh and blood. Well, great. Then let's meet in a week. I'll bring the documents, and we'll get everything sorted, Katerina said cheerfully. They have been sitting for another ten minutes, chatting about trivial matters, and then her daughter, saying Marta needed to sleep, went to her room, leaving Marlene alone again. Though no, Teodoro and Alfredo were still in the house. Marlene, are you selling the house? The boy asked with horror, approaching the woman. It seemed tears were welling up in his eyes. No, well, yes, but Marlene began. Are you leaving me? Alfredo asked tearfully, seeming genuinely frightened. No, of course not. I'll stay here. It's just a formality, Marlene reassured the boy, patting his shoulders. In the evening, her daughter and grandchildren left. Surprisingly, they didn't even stay overnight. Marlene was very disappointed and upset, but she kept telling herself that she had a lot of things to do and take care of. A week passed, and there was no news from Katerina. Marlene had already concluded that Katerina had changed her mind and the deal wouldn't happen. But one weekday morning, she received a letter. It stated that she needed to come to the city to complete all the formalities. Marlene was very anxious about this proposition. She hadn't been to the city for a very long time, and now she was old. How would she endure a three-hour journey, especially standing in a crowded train? But there was no choice. Her daughter asked for help, and Marlene couldn't let her down. The next day, she started packing her bag, took her passport, various house documents, and, of course, prepared some food for the road as she didn't know how long she would be there. Alfredo peeked into the house. He was watching the woman's every move attentively. She was looking for some important paper, and when she found it, she exclaimed in joy. Only after that did she notice the boy and feel embarrassed. Alfredo? Marlene said in surprise, packing her things into the bag. Where are you going? The boy asked, approaching her and peering into her bag. I'm going to the city, the woman replied indifferently. No, she didn't want to hurt the child's feelings, but right now, she was making sure not to forget anything. Otherwise, she would have to go back home and start the journey anew, and she definitely didn't want to. The notary was a serious person. If there's a missing document, you might as well leave. And the letter clearly stated what she needed to bring with her. In the end, Marlene decided to just take everything she had. It would be safer. You said you wouldn't leave me, Alfredo said sadly. I'm not leaving you, for God's sake, the woman couldn't hold back. I have things to do, hear me? Even people of my age have businesses. I don't live just for you. The boy stepped back, looking at the woman with horror in his eyes. It was evident that he was ashamed, but at the same time, those words hurt him terribly. He burst into tears and ran away. Only then did Marlene realize what she had done, scaring an innocent boy like that. What kind of person was she? She wanted to catch up with him and explain, but time was pressing. The train was supposed to arrive in an hour. She was already horribly late. The train station was not far, but for a woman of her age, covering the distance was quite challenging. 
She reached the bus stop, took the right route, and, after arriving, headed towards the train station. There was very little time left, judging by her wristwatch. She almost ran, and as fate would have it, there was a queue at the ticket counter. Marlene, breathing heavily after the run, stood last in line, nervously checking her watch and fidgeting. Excuse me, she called out to the woman in her fifties ahead of her. The woman turned around. Could you let me go first? I'm about to miss my train. It's leaving any moment. Excuse me, why should I do it? The woman replied. I might be running late too, but I'm standing in line like everyone else. It's your problem that you haven't arrived on time. I really need this. My daughter is waiting for me in the city. We have to go to the notary, Marlene explained almost pleadingly. My grandson's waiting for me too. It's his birthday. I won't let you go first, the stranger insisted. What a horrible person. Marlene thought. Why can't people be more compassionate to each other? It's so rude to respond harshly to a simple request. Meanwhile, only a few minutes remained before the train departure. Finally, it was the turn of this rude woman who had been in front of Marlene. I need a ticket to the city for tomorrow, please, the woman requested. Marlene almost had a heart attack. For tomorrow? And this heartless woman couldn't let her go ahead. Marlene was so upset that she wasn't even angry anymore. She was just hurt and saddened by the fact that there are such awful people in the world. As soon as Marlene approached the counter, she heard the sound of the departing train. All hope in her eyes melted away, now she definitely wouldn't get anywhere. Today was the last train going to the city from the nearest station. Due to track repairs, the schedule was reduced by half. Katerina would be terribly disappointed if she didn't see her at 8 a.m. tomorrow at the notary's office. She had let her daughter down. Where do you need to go? The cashier asked bringing her out of her thoughts. Marlene looked at him with despair in her eyes. Nowhere already, she replied in a melancholy voice, trudging back to the bus stop and then home. Now Marlene didn't even know what to do. She didn't have her daughter's phone. Well, she had it somewhere. Katerina left it for her a long time ago. Marlene wrote down the number on a piece of paper, but then she put it somewhere on the desk, and that was it. She never used those mobile phones herself. Why would she need it in the village? They say they're nothing but trouble. If she wanted to send a letter, she could go to the post office again by bus, and she didn't have the strength for that anymore. Why didn't her daughter come for her herself? She had a car, after all. Marlene somehow made it home, sat on the porch, took a moment to catch her breath, and began contemplating what to do next. Alfredo once again interrupted her heavy thoughts. It seemed like he was still upset about the situation that occurred two hours ago. Why didn't you leave? He asked. I missed the train, Marlene replied gloomily. She wasn't in the mood to engage with the boy. Alfredo approached, sitting next to her on the steps. The porch, once painted green like everything else, had long since lost its paint, making it look abandoned and crooked. Marlene tried not to dwell on how much her home had deteriorated. After her husband's death, who used to take care of everything before his illness, everything gradually fell into disrepair. Oh, why didn't they have a son? He would have helped and fixed things up. What are you going to do? Alfredo asked, not letting Marlene distract herself. I don't know. She turned her head towards the boy. Despite his curious gaze, resentment was still evident in his eyes. Listen, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry for yelling at you. It's not your fault, I just really wanted to catch the train and messed up. Plus, the people at this station aren't the nicest characters. People? The boy asked. There was this nasty woman who treated me very poorly. Because of her, I missed the only train going to the city. The boy didn't say anything, he just raised an eyebrow, then ran back to his house. Marlene didn't understand the boy's actions. She had apologized, even though he was just a child. Perhaps she hurt him deeply, and he wouldn't forgive her soon. 
Children are very fragile, and every comment can deeply affect them, and they can carry it into adulthood. Although Marlene understood that it wasn't such a big trauma for the child, surely his parents scold him sometimes too, that's normal. Sometimes children can be very mischievous, and adults often lose their temper with them. But a few minutes later, Alfredo returned. He seemed very excited about something. The boy approached Marlene and said, You can come with us tonight. Are you going somewhere? Marlene was surprised. My parents need to go to the city for some business. They let you come with us. Isn't that great? Marlene was over the moon. She had offended this child so much, yet he paid her with kindness. Come here, my wonderful boy, Marlene exclaimed, embracing Alfredo. He gave her a real gift. After a few minutes, they went to his house to talk to his parents. Good evening, Marlene, the boy's mother greeted. Alfredo told us about the misfortune that happened to you. We are ready to help. When do you want to leave? The woman asked. In an hour already. But you'll have to find your own way back. We'll finish all our business in the morning and head back immediately. But that's not a problem. It's much easier to buy a ticket in the city, Marlene thanked her neighbor. And so it happened. Soon, they set off. The woman was very pleased that she could travel in a spacious and comfortable car instead of enduring a cramped train ride for three hours. They arrived quickly. Marlene gave Katerina's address and they dropped her off right by her house. She thanked them warmly and promised to stay with Alfredo as long as necessary, although she always did so. Her daughter gave her the address many years ago and Marlene hoped she still lived there. The woman managed to climb to a high floor using the stairs as the elevator was not working. She was almost out of breath, hoping that Katerina was at home and would give her something to drink. She felt very uncomfortable. She rang the doorbell. There was no answer for about three minutes. Marlene decided to keep ringing persistently. Finally, she heard footsteps. Were they already sleeping? It was only 10 o'clock in the evening. However, when the door opened, the woman was amazed. There wasn't Katerina in front of her. It was a young girl of about 25, with dyed hair and beautiful white locks falling gracefully on her shoulders. She was in a bathrobe, and behind her there was a little toddler, immediately picked up by an unfamiliar man. Good evening. How can I help you? The sweet girl asked. She seemed a little tired, but tried to be polite. Marlene immediately liked her, but she still didn't understand why this girl was at her daughter's house. Excuse me, doesn't Katerina Iglesias live here? Marlene asked in a hoarse voice, still struggling to breathe. Katerina? She used to live here. Are you her relative? I'm her mother, the woman said, and after that phrase, her eyes began to darken and her ears rang. She swayed and leaned against the wall. Are you okay? The unfamiliar girl asked, trying to help the uninvited guest. Marlene seemed to be losing consciousness. Then the girl called her husband, and together they led the uninvited guest to the couch, laying her down comfortably. The girl brought a glass of water and sat across from her. After a few minutes, Marlene felt better. She still didn't dare speak and tried to calm herself. I'm sorry, the woman apologized taking a sip of water. The elevator wasn't working, and I have a weak heart. It's okay, it happens, the girl reassured her. What's your name? Marlene. And I'm Dorothea. Nice to meet you. You were looking for your daughter, Katerina, right? Yes. I had this address written down in my notebook. I've never been to her place, and I rarely come to the city, almost never. I came today urgently, thinking my daughter would meet me and take me in. After all, she invited me to the notary. To the notary? Dorothea asked, not out of genuine interest, but rather showing politeness and trying to reassure the woman. Yes, we need to formalize something, Marlene explained, taking another sip of water. Do you have Katerina's phone number? Dorothea suddenly asked. No, I always wrote her letters. 
I know it's old-fashioned, but I don't understand anything about phones. Wait, what am I saying? Exclaimed the young mother. I have her phone number. I'm afraid to ask where you got it. Well, we bought this apartment from her two weeks ago. The price was very attractive because she urgently needed to sell it. I don't know the reasons, but my husband and I decided to take the offer and we don't regret it. Look at the renovation here. And we're a young family. She didn't tell me that she sold the apartment. She didn't need money, that's true, but why go to such extremes? She mentioned something about leaving, I don't know where, but it's really urgent, Dorothea replied, scrolling through the contacts on her phone. Ah, here it is, let's call her now. She called her. A minute passed, but no one answered. Let's try again, Dorothea persisted. But the result was the same on the second attempt. Katerina was unavailable. How strange. Maybe she's already asleep? Did you make arrangements to meet? Not at all, but it was taken for granted. She knows I have nowhere to stay in the city. I actually wanted to come to her during the day, but it turned out I only arrived in the evening, and as it turns out, she no longer lives here. Don't get me wrong, Dorothea began delicately, but in my opinion, your daughter is acting strange. How can you treat your mother like that? Well, I'm sure she means no harm. Tomorrow, there will probably be a valid reason for such behavior, and today I'll figure out where to stay. Dorothea exchanged glances with her husband and then nodded approvingly. Listen, stay with us. I'll make up the couch for you, and in the morning, I can take you to the notary. How does that sound? Dorothea suggested it with a smile. Marlene couldn't believe her luck. Today, two good families have helped her get out of such a difficult situation. It was a stroke of luck. If it's not too much trouble, I'd be happy to stay, Marlene said. That's what happened. Dorothea turned out to be very attentive. She made up the couch, fed the poor woman, and poured coffee. How did it happen that you haven't communicated for ten years? Dorothea wondered, sipping her coffee from a mug. I don't know. We used to talk before. She would tell me about her children's birthdays and congratulate me, but then it all faded away, and I didn't really interfere. Who needs such an old lady? I should be choosing a grave for myself. What are you saying? What are you talking about? Dorothea parried. You're a wonderful woman, and as for your daughter, you've been extremely unlucky. My mother died when I was 16. She was hit by a car, she was crossing the road, and the driver was drunk. Tears welled up in the young woman's eyes. If she were alive, how wonderfully would we communicate with her? She would help me with the little one. It seems to me that your Katerina doesn't value you at all. I sympathize with your grief. But I think Katerina is just that kind of person. She wasn't sociable from childhood. She was often bullied for it in school. After finishing college, she started working and became a busy woman, family, her own household, work. She had no time for me. Oh, that's your business. The main thing is for you to be happy. You're still young. You'll have a big family, Marlene reasoned. Raise your children so that they love and respect both you and their father, so that they visit you more often, because in old age, a glass of water is really needed, she awkwardly joked. Dorothea laughed. Oh, it's already midnight. I think it's time to go to bed, said Dorothea, who quickly began to clear the table. Finally, Marlene settled into her improvised bed and quickly fell asleep. This day had tired her out unexpectedly. She certainly didn't expect such adventures. In the morning, the smell of delicious pancakes wafted from the kitchen. Marlene got up and looked at herself in the mirror. She looked quite presentable. The couch turned out to be soft, unlike hers at home, old and rickety, with nails sticking out of the upholstery and pillows more resembling rocks. Oh, Marlene, Dorothea greeted her joyfully. Good morning. Her husband was already sitting at the table, devouring pancakes. It smells so delicious here that I couldn't resist and came in, Marlene explained, entering the kitchen with a shy smile. 
Sit down, your pancakes are already ready, Dorothea said. Marlene sat down opposite Dorothea's husband. We didn't get a chance to meet yesterday. I'm Marlene, the woman introduced herself to the young man. My name is Leo, the guy replied amiably. Family harmony prevailed in the kitchen. It was evident that these people had truly married for love. Suddenly, a baby began crying in the other room. Dorothea immediately jumped up and rushed out of the kitchen. I apologize for such a question. Is it a boy or a girl? Marlene asked. A boy, Pedro. I know, a common name, but Dorothea always wanted to name her little one that way, Leo replied. Marlene nodded with a smile. Once upon a time, her husband, Ignacio, chose the name for their daughter. It happened because she experienced unimaginable agony during childbirth. And Marlene decided to name her daughter Katerina after her great-grandmother. She was a great woman. She hoped that the energy of this name would be transmitted to Katerina. And so it happened. However, Katerina increasingly immersed herself in books, becoming a reserved girl, and then she left, leaving the old parents alone. Ignacio passed away five years ago. The reserved money was enough only for a decent funeral and a good memorial service. But what saddened Marlene the most was that Katerina didn't even come to her own father's funeral, and she didn't show up to support her grieving mother afterwards. In general, she behaved horribly. But Marlene still loved her. Special people are always a little indifferent to the feelings and needs of others, and she considered her daughter special. Otherwise, how could she have entered college without any money and then settled well in the capital? Not everyone can boast of that. True, now she seemed to be in trouble, but Marlene would help her. It was her duty as a mother. After breakfast, Dorothea went somewhere on business and dropped Marlene off at the notary's office on the way. The woman really hoped that at least the address mentioned in the letter was correct. Leaving the car, she immediately saw a large sign on the building across the street saying notary. She entered the building, went to the right floor, gave her name at the registration desk, and was invited to the waiting area. After a few minutes, Katerina finally appeared. She was dressed in a strict business suit, a black jacket, a light blue blouse, and perfectly pressed trousers. She was holding a brown folder with documents in her hands. As soon as Katerina saw her mother, she immediately sat next to her, silently nodding. It was strange. Usually, people, even when parting for a short time, greet each other. No, apparently, Marlene definitely made some mistakes in her upbringing. Hello, daughter, the mother began. But her daughter immediately interrupted her. Please be quiet she said sharply. Marlene was even slightly offended. Why is that? She began to get agitated. I want to focus on the upcoming deal. Did you bring all the documents? Yes. Aren't you going to ask where I spent the night yesterday? I'm not interested. How dare you talk to me like this? Marlene switched to a stricter tone. She could get angry when necessary. With such an attitude, you won't get my house, you know. And no money either. Katerina turned to her and forced a smile. Well, Mom, you're right. I'm too rude to you. I'm sorry. That's it, the woman said, waving her hand. Perhaps it's stress. The fear of losing everything affects me a lot. Well, of course, when you urgently sell an apartment, anything can happen, the mother remarked. Katerina got angry at her again. Be quiet. It's better not to talk unnecessarily about deals in this room. Everything can work against you. See those people in uniform over there? They're definitely not standing here for nothing. They're probably checking something. Maybe check if visitors pay taxes. And do you pay? Mom, please. I'll be quiet, okay? Marlene squeaked offendedly. So they have been sitting for about 20 minutes. Katerina was looking at something on her phone, while Marlene, with nothing better to do, was examining everything around her. Everyone was tense, constantly shuffling papers, and nervous. Finally, a large group of lively people came out of the door and headed for the exit. 
The secretary approached Katerina and Marlene and invited them into the office. They entered and took out their passports and documents. An incredibly strict and dignified man in expensive glasses was sitting at the table. His eyebrows were furrowed. He was examining some papers in front of him. Hearing the newcomers, he looked up. So, are you Marlene and Katerina? He asked sternly, studying the women with his gaze. They nodded in agreement. Please, have a seat. Mother and daughter glanced at each other and sat in the chairs. Katerina, as I understand it, you intend to buy real estate from Marlene, your mother. Is that correct? He asked. Katerina nodded. Let me find out, for what purpose? The man asked. Marlene already understood that this was the notary himself. You know, I have two little children, not counting my eldest daughter, who is a student. Our family has grown, and we need more space. I live in a small apartment in the city. After the breakup with my husband, I have a one-room apartment with the kids. Here, please take a look at the documents. Marlene couldn't believe her ears. How well she was lying. So that's why she sold her large apartment in the center a week ago. Do you live with your husband, or are you a single mother? The notary asked. He left the family when I gave birth to our second child, Katerina replied plaintively. According to the documents, we are still married, but he plays absolutely no role in raising the children, Katerina answered, so I asked my mother to help. She is willing to sell her house to us because... Katerina looked at Marlene as if she were hinting at something, and then even stepped on her foot under the table. Marlene understood that it was her turn to lie. Yes, I confirm. I may soon join the majority, and they still have a lot of time to live. I can't leave them alone, but I can't leave myself without means of subsistence, so I suggested my daughter by my house. Where will you live then? The notary inquired. Me? I will move to a nursing home. My daughter found a very good one for me, and the money from the sale will come in handy. I can't live alone. The time has come. Well, I understand, said the notary. Will you be paying with child benefits for this purchase? He asked Katerina. She nodded. They were asked to wait a little longer while they prepared all the documents. After two hours, during which Marlene was already terribly tired, everything was finally signed as required. So, today we will send the documents for verification. When the transaction is registered, approximately in three working days, the pension fund will transfer the money to the seller. I will return your certificate with a mark to you. We also need a power of attorney for me to receive the money for my mom, Katerina suddenly said firmly. Why is that? Marlene started. Do you want to come here again? Her daughter dryly asked, giving her a fierce look that said, Why are you arguing? We've already agreed on everything. Oh, yes, yes, Marlene hurriedly realized, of course. Forgive me, I'm an old woman. Half an hour later, they were given the power of attorney. All the best, the notary concluded, signing the document. Have a nice day. Finally, they were free. Marlene desperately wanted to go home, away from all these complexities, from these papers, from the crowd, the hustle, and the noise of the big city. When they left the building, Katerina, having called a taxi for her mother to the station, was already preparing to say goodbye and leave for her own affairs, but Marlene stopped her. Don't you want to tell me anything? She asked sternly. About what exactly? Why did you sell your good, large apartment? Surely only for the sake of having them transfer this money for my house to you. But it's worth much more. Oh, mom, it's none of your business. I have to run. And Katerina was about to leave again, but her mother's words stopped her. I went to your old apartment yesterday. By fate, a young couple gave me shelter there. You probably know them as they bought your former apartment. Why didn't you even warn me that you had moved out? Why didn't you give me a ride to the city? I thought you cared about me and thought you needed me. But you only needed that wretched money. Katerina's face immediately darkened noticeably. 
It was as if she felt guilty for her wrongdoing, and even though she was already quite old, she looked like a five-year-old child being scolded by her mother. Mom, I had a terrible day yesterday. I had a fight with my husband, and Marta got sick and cried all day. I physically couldn't invite you in. We had just moved in, and in that small apartment, there wasn't enough space even for us, the daughter explained. And I couldn't come to pick you up either. If only you knew how busy I am right now and how overwhelmed I am with solving all these problems. You made your choice, Marlene shrugged. But you could have at least warned that you couldn't provide me with a place to stay. I would have come in the morning, but because of you, I bothered the neighbors. They gave me a ride in their car so I could sleep at a stranger's house afterward. Mom, I'm sorry, Katerina approached and hugged her mother. Marlene immediately melted from these embraces. Her daughter rarely hugged her, and perhaps today, guilt gnawed at her so much that she decided to show affection. Are you going home now? Katerina asked. Do you want me to go with you to the station? If it's not too much trouble. Mom, what are you saying? And indeed, Katerina ordered a taxi for her mother, and she herself went with her, drove her to the train station, bought her a ticket in a comfortable seat by the window, and only when she was sure that everything was fine with Marlene did she leave the train. Finally, Marlene felt both needed and loved. She dozed off halfway and almost missed her station. The man sitting next to her woke her up. When she finally reached her home, she sat down on the familiar, worn-out porch again and breathed a sigh of relief. This adventure had dragged on for too long, and she was so glad to find herself at home. As soon as Alfredo saw her from behind the fence, he immediately ran up to her. Marlene, are you back? Did you finish all your business? Alfredo shouted in delight. Yes, dear, the woman replied, stroking the boy's head and tousling his hair. Today is my mom's birthday. She invited you. Will you come? Marlene pondered. She looked terrible. She hadn't changed clothes in the last two days. When does she want me to come? The woman clarified. At eight in the evening. Come, it will be fun. Marlene laughed and nodded affirmatively. She had to take a shower, pick a dress, and dry her hair, and she was ready. The preparations didn't take much time. It wasn't youth anymore when she spent two and a half hours getting ready for a disco. Now she needed to tidy herself up. Nothing more was needed. Marlene. Alfredo exclaimed when he saw Marlene entering. He ran up to her and led her to sit beside him. The company was small, Alfredo's parents and another young neighbor, probably their friend. I want to make a toast, Marlene said when about half an hour had passed since the start of the festive dinner. Everyone turned to her and listened attentively. I want to thank an incredible woman. A woman without whom this wonderful boy wouldn't be living. Alfredo is so well-mannered. Of course, he took an example from his parents and especially from his mother. You raised him with tenderness and care. I want to thank you for this wonderful child. Thanks to him, I don't feel lonely. To the amazing mom. Everyone was delighted with such a heartfelt speech and immediately clinked glasses. After that, Alfredo even hugged his country grandma. He, too, really liked these sincere words. Thank you so much, Marlene, Alfredo's mother politely replied. Without you, I wouldn't have been able to raise such a son. For him, you are the true, beloved grandma who will give wise advice and tell a bedtime story. Unfortunately, I can't boast that I spend a lot of time with the child. Unfortunately, work takes away our most precious time. But every minute spent with him, I value more than life itself. To Alfredo and his grandma Marlene. Everyone remained impressed with tonight's gathering, then played cards, bingo, and hide-and-seek. Everyone had a great time. Around 11 p.m., Marlene decided to leave. She was already feeling sleepy. She said her goodbyes and went back to her place. Behind the fence, next to the gate, in the darkness, she noticed a huge box but didn't pay much attention to it. Maybe one of the neighbors unloaded something. She would find out tomorrow. 
Today, she was too tired. Marlene decided to deal with it in the morning. Finally, this day came to an end, and it ended well. Despite all the difficulties and problems in her relationship with her daughter Katerina, she was initially very upset today, but later she calmed down. She wanted to change, it was evident, or else why would she see her mother off to the train? Her daughter wished her only the best. That's what she wanted to believe. The next day brought another surprise under Marlene's porch. During breakfast, she remembered the box that was standing at the exit of the house. The woman went outside and confirmed that yesterday's enormous box wasn't a dream. Now she could examine it from all sides. On top, there was a sheet with someone's signatures. Marlene put on her glasses, carefully read the document, and understood that it was a warranty for a washing machine. It wasn't hard to guess that it was inside. She found a note right away. Mommy, this is for you. Marlene smiled and was about to call the neighbors to help drag the box inside, but Alfredo approached from behind and asked about his curiosity. Marlene, what is this? Marlene turned around and replied with a smile. A washing machine. A gift from my daughter, she said. What does it do? Don't you know? It washes clothes. After this logical answer, the boy darted somewhere, and the woman began to think about how to drag this machine into the house and stay alive. But she didn't have to think long. Soon Alfredo's dad came to the rescue. Together with another neighbor, he dragged the washing machine into the kitchen, unpacked it, and even connected it to water and electricity. It was now in working order. Marlene thanked him with two jars of fresh juice made from garden berries. How caring she is. Marlene thought about her daughter Katerina every time she looked at her splendid gift. Summer was coming to an end. August always brought some disappointment. For many people, these days seemed like the end of a happy life, the end of bright and warm days, and a good daylight regimen. Marlene was no exception. Before the onset of autumn, she always felt melancholic. For Alfredo, the boy she looked after, this time also meant a lot. He was going to the first grade this year. He was very scared, and he tried not to think about it, although almost every conversation led to this topic. One day, at around 4 p.m., when the sun had left its zenith in the sky, Alfredo and Marlene were sitting on the porch of the boy's house. During this post-lunch time, there was an inexplicable desire to sleep. The parents were doing something in the garden, and Marlene dozed off while reading a book. Can I not go to school after all? The boy asked, looking at his fingers. It was as if he saw some mystery in them. Marlene asked him to repeat the question, so the boy did. How is that? What? The woman exclaimed. Are you serious? I understand everything already, and now I have to get up at 6 in the morning every day and go to school. But I can gain knowledge on my own. You have strange thoughts for a first grader. You should strive for knowledge. You can't imagine how much more you will learn, and school is not just about studying, it's also about interacting with other kids. You need to find friends. Why do I need friends? Can't I live on my own? Just imagine what it would be like for me if it weren't for you and your parents. I always need help, and you, as my friend, always help me out. Can I handle problems on my own? The little boy persisted. Life is a tricky thing. In general, it really loves surprises. Sometimes they are pleasant, and sometimes they are horrifying. Is life so complicated that you need to study to live? Unfortunately, yes. Life is often unfair to people. Some get everything, others get nothing. There are many people in the world, and some of them have bad intentions. We're not to blame for that, but we have to live with it. You use so many confusing words, Marlene, Alfredo couldn't hold back and pouted. Well, someday I won't be around anymore, and you'll remember my words. With that, their conversation ended, there was no point in explaining the complex system of the big life to a seven-year-old. He was still too young to understand anything. For him, the world was rainbow-colored and beautiful. In his opinion, there were only kind and caring people in it, but that was not entirely true. 
And soon, Marlene found this out once again through her own experience. Soon, real autumn arrived. Yellow leaves slowly fell from the trees, and cracked brown chestnuts were scattered everywhere. A spreading chestnut tree grew right in front of Alfredo's parents' house. The air temperature was gradually dropping. Marlene increasingly preferred reading a book at home rather than outside. She asked the local men to chop enough firewood to last until the end of autumn, maybe even through a long winter. Now, almost every day, Marlene was heating her stove. Alfredo had gone to the city, and before that, he tearfully said goodbye to his grandmother. He really didn't want to go to school. The boy was afraid that he would forget about Marlene and would not come here anymore because, in his opinion, childhood was over. But, of course, that was not the case, and Marlene was already looking forward to the next summer to meet her dear boy again. One day in October, Marlene was washing the dishes, and through the window, she saw some unfamiliar people hanging around her house. They were inspecting the facade, occasionally pointing at the house. The window Marlene was looking through was on the side and not visible from the facade. She felt a bit uneasy. Many neighbors had already left, and those who remained were not familiar to her, and she hadn't done anything to them for them to have any grievances. She wiped her hands on her apron and went to the front door. Looking through the peephole, she saw that these people were inexplicably interested in her house and opened the door. They immediately turned their gaze to her. Good afternoon. Do you need something? Marlene asked. But when she saw the faces of the familiar family, she almost lost her speech. Marlene? The woman exclaimed. What are you doing here? It was the same family with whom she stayed overnight in Katerina's former apartment, the family to whom her daughter sold the apartment. And now they were standing right in front of her, not understanding how this woman, whom they once sheltered, could be here. I live here, Marlene simply replied. You live here? Leo marveled, surveying the house. Yes, the woman continued to assert, not understanding what they wanted from her. And how did you end up here? Marlene. Oh, Marlene, Dorotea said wearily, let's go inside, I'll explain everything. Honestly, this is all very strange. Marlene, of course, gladly invited them into the house. She heated the kettle, poured coffee for the guests, and brought out strawberry jam. Why are you here without the little one? Marlene asked, sitting in an armchair opposite the sofa. Well, the thing is, Dorotea began. It was evident that she didn't know how to start this conversation. The topic was too complicated for her, and she didn't know how Marlene would react to this news. Your daughter sold us this house and the land. The girl fell silent and raised her gaze to see the woman's reaction. Marlene paled. At first, her eyes showed confusion, then fear, turning into anger, and then anger turned to despair, and tears streamed from the eyes of the poor woman. Are you sure? Marlene was crying. Maybe she sold you a different plot, and you mistakenly came here. Unfortunately, no, Dorotea replied with sympathy in her voice. It's exactly that address. Why did you buy this house if you knew I lived here? That's the problem. Katerina assured us that no one had lived here for a long time. And she set such a low price that it would be a sin not to buy, especially since she called us first because we were already buying an apartment from her. She said we could also buy a summer house on favorable terms. Oh Lord, she sold her own mother, the tearful woman exclaimed. Dorotea sat next to her, trying to comfort her with a gentle pat on the back. I don't understand why your daughter did this, but she was in a hurry to sell the property urgently. Where was she rushing to? Marlene snapped out of her trance and depression. She didn't say, she just insisted that all this needed to be done very quickly, so we immediately processed the documents, literally the day after the offer. We didn't even go to see the house because Katerina assured us that it was only good for demolition. Oh Lord! Marlene exclaimed. How could she? She is heartless. She herself said to transfer the house to her name and out of the kindness of my soul. Oh God, how horribly she acted. She will pay for this, 
my bitter tears will be repaid. She is my own flesh and blood, but such a scoundrel. I raised her all my life, dressed her, fed her, kissed her little forehead, and here she shows her filial gratitude. I understand your grief, Dorothea said softly, but you also should understand us. We had no idea that someone lived here at all, otherwise, we would never have bought your house. Oh, what sorrow, the woman tortured herself. Where will I, the old lady, go now? Wander the world? Lord, what will happen now? Well, hold on, Dorothea comforted her. No one is kicking you out of here. Yes, Leo? She turned to her husband, seeking support. He nodded in agreement. We are planning to come here only for the summer and weekends. Are you not joking? Is it true? The woman looked at her with hope in her eyes. Of course, this is rightfully your home. You have been living here your whole life. It doesn't matter who the owner is. I am sure we will be friends with you, Dorothea reassured her. She hugged Marlene tightly, and gradually, Marlene began to calm down. Everything happened as Dorothea had said. They indeed became friends. The family came the next weekend. Marlene gave them her room with a double bed, and she moved to Katerina's former room. Being there was even more unpleasant after her daughter's deed. Katerina herself didn't respond to calls or letters. The number was unavailable at any time they tried to reach her. It seemed the washing machine was her peculiar farewell gift. Please, come to the table, Marlene called the family, placing soup on the table. She had cooked an amazing soup that all household members appreciated. Marlene, Leo, and I wanted to propose something to you, Dorothea announced. We noticed that instead of gas heating, you have an old stove. It's dangerous, there could be a fire. Moreover, at your age, it's not suitable to heat the stove every day. And the rooms are quite damp, one stove doesn't heat the whole house properly. Of course, Marlene agreed absentmindedly. My little house is already not in the best condition, but what can I do? So here's the thing, Dorothea continued. We decided to install gas, put in radiators, and, in general, renovate the house to make it look more modern and be more comfortable to live in. What do you think about it? I'm all for it, Dorothea. I'll even help with money. My pension is not big, but... No need, Leo smiled. We'll handle the expenses ourselves. They came to an agreement. Already from the next weekend, Leo brought workers to the house. They installed radiators, laid pipes, and soon brought gas to the house. Life began to improve. Marlene helped the family as much as she could, cooking, cleaning. Her life now somewhat resembled the fate of a servant, but she didn't feel it, as she had always been bored alone. Now she had a semblance of a family that needed her support. As the young mother was busy with the child, repairs, and some remote work, she constantly did something on her laptop. And Marlene was happy to prepare pastries, bake, make coffee, and set the table for everyone. The feeling that she could be useful again brought her incredible joy. Little by little, they made good repairs in the house, insulated the walls, plastered them, added wooden panels in some places, renewed the floors, fixed the roof, there were no more leaks from the attic. They replaced the old stove with a modern fireplace and even changed the old furniture. Now the sofa was not as lumpy, and the table didn't stubbornly collapse at the most inconvenient moment. Marlene rejoiced at these changes. This family, which had become so close to her, maybe shouldn't have lived here, but still, thanks to them, her own life had truly changed for the better. It was a sunny and warm late April day. Flowers were blooming in the garden, and on one of these spring days, it was Marlene's birthday. She wasn't used to celebrating it, and rarely did anyone congratulate her now. Her own daughter had stopped doing it a long time ago. Close friends either died or moved away, leaving only her husband, but when he died, there was no one left even to remember this date. But this year brought such drastic changes that they couldn't help but touch this wonderful holiday. All morning, they didn't let her out and forbade her to look out the window, but meanwhile, something was happening outside the walls. 
Even though she had bad hearing, it was hard not to hear the sound of a large car or trailer arriving. Well, what's happening there? Can I finally come out? Marlene asked Dorothea, puzzled. Patience, Marlene, wait a bit, Dorothea mysteriously replied. Finally, at three in the afternoon, they let her out of the house, or more precisely, blindfolded her and led her somewhere away. When Marlene smelled the sharp scent of fresh wood, she began to guess the surprise. When they finally uncovered her eyes, she almost screamed with joy, like a five-year-old child. Before her, there was a real little house with carved shutters, even the staircase railings were beautifully decorated with various patterns, and the red tiled roof was glistening in the sunlight. Dear Marlene, Leo began his speech standing at the entrance to the door of this little house. On this day, there is much we'd like to say to you, but I believe our gift will say more than thousands of words. We are very grateful to you for giving your room to our little son, who will grow up and consider you his grandmother. You said you would live in the living room, but, of course, that can't be like this. Now you are almost a member of our family, and we want to express our gratitude with this gift. We bought a separate little house for you, as you can see. It has all the conveniences, from a television to a toilet. We want you to feel comfortable and have your own space. Initially, this house was intended as a guest house, but then my beloved wife decided it would be yours. Oh, well, when I die, it will become a guest house, Marlene awkwardly joked, wiping away a tear. Marlene. Dorothea pretended to be offended. Marlene just laughed in response. In short, Leo continued, We, along with the whole team of workers, want to congratulate you on your birthday and wish you health and many more years of life. Marlene thanked everyone and finally entered her new home. It didn't look like a guest house at all. It was a full-fledged house, just a bit smaller. There were two rooms, a large one served as a living room, connected to a cozy kitchen, and from there, a door led to the bedroom. The clean, sparkling tiled bathroom almost made Marlene cry. Of course, there was still no furniture, but, as Leo said, it was only the beginning. A week later, they started furnishing this house. First, they installed gas and electricity. Marlene got a very soft bed. She felt awkward receiving so many gifts, as the family did all this at their expense. And why? She was a complete stranger to them. Marlene didn't understand this because they had no family ties, they were not even distant relatives, yet these people took care of her more than anyone else had in her entire life. Summer arrived. Unbearable heat started in June. Everyone was already wearing shorts, and Leo and Dorothea set up a pool in the backyard. Finally, Alfredo came to the summer house. Marlene had been eagerly awaiting his arrival and even gave him a box of chocolates. Marlene, do you live here now? The boy wondered. Yes, dear. It's a long story, but now everything is fine. Someday, I'll find the time to tell you this horrifying and, at the same time, wonderful story. But now, let's go sunbathe in the sun, Marlene replied. The boy couldn't hide his amazement. He still didn't understand who these people were or why they were living in Marlene's house. The family was relaxing together in the sun. Alfredo and Pedro immediately found a common language and were already splashing in the pool together, while Leo and Dorotillo were laying under the umbrella to avoid the scorching sun rays. You know, I once studied at the history faculty and went for summer internships on various excavations, Leo suddenly said out of the blue. Marlene, who was lounging nearby on a sun lounger, turned to him. Missing the old times? She jokingly suggested, laughing. Not that I miss them, more like, I just looked around, at this land, at the old church in the village, and remembered your words. You said that there used to be another house on this very spot, and the village is over 100 years old. Is that right? Marlene nodded affirmatively. What if something is still left from those times here? Very often, if no excavations have been conducted and the foundation of the house hasn't been changed, you can find very interesting things, the guy explained. Dorotea was interested and joined the conversation, coming out of the pool and covering herself with a towel. 
Do you want to conduct the excavations? She asked with enthusiasm, squealing with joy. Well, I didn't say that. Excavations? Where? When? Alfredo exclaimed, intrigued. This topic captivated everyone present. Okay, Leo laughed, raising his hands. Next weekend, I'll bring a metal detector, and we'll look for something here. Everyone actively supported this idea. Dorothea told Marlene what she wanted to find here. What if we find a silver spoon or coins from the 17th century? She exclaimed in admiration while putting Pedro to sleep. We'll find something, the tired Marlene replied monotonously, stirring her coffee with a spoon, I'm sure of it. A week later, Leo brought the metal detector, as promised. Everyone gathered around the guy while he assembled the device. What if we find old skeletons here? The restless Alfredo asked. I hope not, Dorothea sarcastically replied, and everyone laughed. Finally, the metal detector was ready for use. Leo stood up and started moving it from side to side. It barely made a beeping sound. The guy was slowly walking forward, sweeping the device. Finally, the metal detector beeped quite loudly. Alfredo even covered his ears from the sound. It was clearly unpleasant. Oh my God, I found it. Leo shouted. He frantically began to dig with his hands into the sand, but when he lifted the item lying among the grass, he was quite disappointed. It was just an ordinary gold earring, modern, not antique. He shook off the dirt, and Dorothea immediately rushed to him. My earring. Remember, I said back in February that I lost it somewhere? It's here. Can you believe it? We found it. The girl exclaimed in admiration. Well, at least someone found joy in this discovery. Leo didn't give up and continued to search. From time to time, he found rusty nails or a broken lead spoon, but there were no treasures in sight. The guy was about to call it a day, and everyone was quite tired, but suddenly, the metal detector beeped in a completely unexpected place, near an old shed. There, Leo found no earrings or nails. Everything was clear, they needed to go into the shed, but the problem was that it was locked. Marlene, do you have the keys to this shed? The guy asked the woman. I'm afraid to disappoint you, they should be somewhere, but it will take a long time to search, Marlene replied sadly. In that case, we'll break in, said Leo. He brought a real crowbar from the house and easily opened the lock. It turned out to be very weak, and the boards literally crumbled in his hands. Apparently, this shed, like the house on the old foundation, was many years old. When they entered, the metal detector beeped again. It beeped very loudly. Dorothea, Pedro, and Alfredo covered their ears to somehow protect themselves from this terrible noise. There was no floor in the shed. It was completely bare, hard, and compressed like stone. Looks like we need a sturdy shovel, Leo informed me and went searching for the right tool again. Marlene, do you think there is something worthwhile in there? Dorothea asked the woman. I really hope so, because finding out will require quite a lot of effort, she remarked. After five minutes, the guy returned with a huge shovel. He ran the metal detector over the presumed treasure location again. The device beeped again, meaning they had to act. The soil resisted the shovel for a long time. It was horribly hard, but eventually, Leo started digging. These excavations took several days. The family, except for the diligent treasure hunter, laughed and teased Leo to stop doing nonsense. He made a lot of effort. What if he found another rusty lock? One day, the family, excluding the enthusiastic treasure hunter, was sitting at the kitchen table, drinking coffee. Alfredo, who came to visit Pedro, was telling about his new school friend. I hope Roberto is a good boy, Marlene remarked. Of course, Alfredo replied, we're building a model airplane together. Suddenly, they heard a scream from the backyard. Oh my God. Lord. Leo yelled. Everyone exchanged glances and rushed to the scene. Leo, are you okay? Dorothea shouted, reaching the shed. Dorothea, Marlene, come here quickly, the guy continued to shout. 
When everyone arrived and approached, what they saw struck them to the core. At the bottom of a white pit, almost one and a half meters deep, the lid of a large wooden chest secured with iron strips was visible. Leo shone a flashlight into the pit and couldn't believe his eyes. What is this? His wife wondered. It's a chest. A real, damn it, old chest. We need to get it out of there. So Leo did. The final excavations took another couple of days. Alfredo's father helped to get it out. Everyone, including the household and neighbors, was standing around, scrutinizing this amazing find. The chest had a thick chain with an amber lock, and unlike the lock on the shed, this one didn't fall apart. It was very sturdy, albeit rusty, as if it were made of cast iron. The wood, on the other hand, had cracked but not swollen. The chest seemed very strong. Dorotea, bring bolt cutters, the guy said to his wife. In just three minutes, they cut through the old chain. Now, the task was almost done, to open the coveted chest and find out what was inside. At that moment, everyone froze. Each wanted to know what secret was stored in this ancient artifact, but it was also frightening. What if there was something very scary inside? Nevertheless, they decided to take the risk. Leo took hold of the lid and opened the chest. The contents literally dazzled everyone. My goodness! Marlene exclaimed in amazement. The chest contained numerous gold ornaments, though somewhat dulled by time, and beneath them were real gold and old coins. Everyone was in shock. No one understood where this chest came from or how it got here. It was clear that these treasures carried not only monetary value, but also historical significance. They dragged the chest into the house and, late in the evening, held a council to decide what to do with it. Dorotea, Leo, and Marlene were sitting at the table. We need to call the police, Leo said after a long silence. Why on earth? Dorotea objected. These treasures are rightfully ours, we won't give them to anyone. This is our treasure. Don't you want to provide a happy life for our child? Our child is already living quite decently, her husband calmly replied, and concealing this treasure will result in a fine and a very large one. Leo, darling, Dorotea pleaded with him, come on, let's at least take a week to think and decide what to do with this. Maybe someone can give us advice. Who will give us advice? What advice? Since you're planning to hide this treasure, who are you going to tell? What about the neighbors? They already know. Dorotea fell silent. Marlene had been sitting in silence all this time, but this time she decided to speak up. I agree with Dorotea, we can't decide everything in haste. First, we need to think it over thoroughly and find out, at least, to whom exactly we should report the find. The police is hardly a good option. Leo resisted for a long time, but in the end, the women convinced him to wait. Life went on as before, and outwardly, nothing changed, as if they had not found the most valuable treasure in their lives. Somewhere far away in the Czech Republic, Katerina, who had left the country, was now living. Since she ran away without saying anything to her mother, more than a year has passed. She sold all her property for this purpose, to leave the country. The thing was that she and her husband had accumulated huge debts, he had gotten on the radar of real gangsters to whom he owed a large sum. In this way, the family hoped to escape persecution and solve all their difficulties. Surprisingly, they succeeded. One evening, getting ready in front of the mirror for another night out, Katerina saw that an old friend was calling her. They had been very close since childhood, they were born and raised in the same village, then both moved to the capital. There, their paths diverged, but after several years, they became friends again and continued to communicate. Katerina, the friend said into the phone. Aurora? The woman exclaimed in surprise. How long has it been since I heard your voice? How are you? Why did you decide to call and reminisce about our youth? I'm fine. I'm calling you to tell you something. It's related to your mother. These words intrigued Katerina a lot. Yesterday, I was at a family gathering. Well, there were Nora, Natalia, and my grandmother Laura. 
Do you remember her? Aurora asked. How could I forget her? A formidable woman. So, Grandma told me a legend. At first, I thought it was complete nonsense. But as soon as I heard your name, I realized it was all true. She told me that a long time ago, a landowner who lived in our area in that same village fell head over heels in love with his serf. He courted her in every possible way. They even had children. One day he gave her a chest crammed with imperial gold coins, jewelry, and other treasures. Turbulent times were approaching. Perhaps he decided that this way he could save at least part of the family treasures, thinking that no one would look for them in her yard. In short, that yard, please don't faint, is where your mother's house now stands. Wow, that's incredible, Katerina exclaimed, amazed. Yes, it is, her friend confirmed. And during the revolution, that former serf, the baron even granted her freedom, hid the little chest somewhere in the ground. But she didn't have time to retrieve it. She was killed back then, along with all her little bastards, the master's illegitimate children. Since then, no one has seen the chest, and rumors have it that it still lies there in the same house, in your mother's house, Katerina. Katerina felt a sense of emptiness when she heard about her mother. The meaning of her friend's words still hadn't fully sunk in. But as soon as she understood the situation, she replied very abruptly and firmly. Thanks for the information, friend. I won't forget. Acacio, she called her husband, cancel the theater. We're going home. And in Marlene's house, or rather, her former house, everything was very calm. The family members no longer argued about the chest, they hid it in a secure place where even the most cunning thief couldn't reach it. One early morning, while everyone was still asleep, Dorotea heard a knock on the door. This knock was so annoying and intrusive that she had to get out of the warm bed and go open the door. She did not expect to see Katerina behind the door. Katerina was clearly in a furious mood. Well, hello, the former mistress greeted haughtily. Hello, Katerina. Why are you here? Dorotea began, but was interrupted by this rude woman. I'll be the one asking the questions, she said, and, rudely pushing Dorotea aside, she entered the house. She examined it for a long time and then asked just as harshly, Where's my mother? Marlene? Well, she. Did you evict her? How dare you? Katerina shouted. You won't even let me speak, Dorotea couldn't take it anymore. Marlene lives in a new house that we built for her. And you didn't get in touch for a whole year. You sold the house to your own mother. Leo came in when he heard someone was arguing, and Marlene followed from the yard. No one expected to see Katerina here. Katerina? Marlene was surprised. There was anger in her eyes. Mom, I'm so glad to see you. Katerina immediately switched to another guy's and approached her mother to hug her, but Marlene rejected it. Her mother forcefully pushed her daughter away and spoke with terrible resentment. You are no longer my daughter. Why are you saying such things? Are you out of your mind? You left me here alone, and then you sold everything I had. And I trusted you and loved you. You're just a con artist. How dare you? Katerina protested and was about to strike her own mother, but Leo placed a heavy hand on her shoulder. Katerina, he began sternly, you are not welcome here. I declare this purchase and sale agreement invalid. Say goodbye to this house, Katerina retorted, and with her head held high, she left. Everyone was left with a bitter aftertaste from this unexpected visit by a guest from the past. They all gathered in the living room and started thinking about what to do next. I think she wasn't joking about canceling the deal, Dorotea said fearfully. I believe she's just trying to intimidate us, Marlene said. She looked very arrogant, Leo noted. And the main question, why does she need all this? Dorotea pondered, supporting her head with her hand. She appeared out of nowhere, attacked us, and started a scandal. Why? Only God knows where she's been all this time and what's on her mind, Leo added. But most importantly, we mustn't tell her about the treasure. In no way should she know that we found something here. 
Marlene, do you understand? She's no longer my daughter, and she won't find out anything. I guarantee you that, Marlene firmly replied. She was truly confident in her decision. Katerina not only undermined trust, but also betrayed her mother, thus destroying everything Marlene had so fervently wanted to save. She didn't need these warm relationships. She didn't need a mother. She had become a cruel and cynical person. It was unclear where she had acquired such cynicism and indifference, but now she was definitely not Marlene's daughter. She was no longer that little, naive girl whom Marlene had once loved. Two days passed after this unexpected visit. Marlene was walking with Alfredo, discussing school with him, when the boy asked a question completely unrelated to the topic. Marlene, will you give me the gold coins from that treasure? Sorry, I don't understand, the woman replied. Well, I helped you search for the treasure. Don't I deserve a reward? Alfredo, I'm sorry, but this money doesn't belong to you. Then who do they belong to? The boy suddenly raised his voice. To you and your new family? Do you no longer need me? Friends don't treat each other this way. Alfredo, you've misunderstood everything. The boy abruptly released Marlene's hand, stopped, and looked at her with an angry and hurt expression. You're a bad friend, he said, turned around, and ran back to his house. Marlene was left alone. She couldn't understand why Alfredo was upset with her. He was already seven years old. Shouldn't he have been taught not to take things that didn't belong to him? Feeling dreadful, she returned home. Alfredo was nowhere to be seen. It seemed he was sulking at home. She entered the large house where Dorotea and Leo were having dinner and discussing something animatedly. She didn't want to intrude on their family's bliss. Marlene was about to leave quietly, but the couple noticed her. Marlene, where are you going? Join us, the man invited her. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you, explained the disheartened woman, approaching the table where the young couple was seated. Oh, no, quite the opposite. We actually wanted to ask you for a favor, Dorotea said. Leo and I want to go for a short walk, and we have no one to leave Pedro with. Could you? Of course, I'll stay with him, Marlene replied, preempting the request. The young couple warmly thanked the woman and left. How wonderful it is here! Dorotea exclaimed, slowly walking arm in arm with her husband. Suddenly, she noticed a small figure by the lake. A person was sitting on the grass, throwing stones into the water. Dorotea recognized Alfredo. What was he doing by the lake so late in the evening? Where were his parents? Dorotea was about to go and ask the boy what had happened and why he was wandering alone so late, but suddenly, a dark female figure approached him. Leo and Dorotea hid behind the bushes, ready to intervene and protect Alfredo if necessary, but it wasn't required yet. They recognized the woman as Katerina and decided to eavesdrop on the emerging conversation. Hey, kid, hi. Are you alone here? Katerina asked, sitting down next to Alfredo. He was still angry and didn't respond immediately. Not alone anymore, he finally replied gruffly. It's not safe for such a little boy to come to the lake so late. Who knows, maybe mermaids will drag you in, Katerina said ironically. Mermaids don't exist. It's just a legend. What if it's not a legend but the truth? People don't believe in them just because they've never seen them. Legends exist to scare little children, but I'm already grown up, and I know where the truth is and where the lies are, Alfredo insisted. Well, I don't think my legend will scare you away. And what's even better is that this story isn't made up. What story? The boy asked with interest. Are you sure you want to know? Katerina teased him. Of course. Well, then, listen. Many years ago, ordinary people lived in this village. They were engaged in agriculture and were very poor. But one day, a wealthy landowner came here and fell in love with one of the peasant girls. He gave her a chest with numerous jewels as a sign of his fidelity and love. However, this poor girl was so afraid that the treasures would be stolen that she buried them in the barn. 
She didn't even have a chance to try on those beautiful jewels. She was brutally killed by terrible people. And where is the truth in all of this? Alfredo persisted. The truth lies in the fact that this girl lived where Marlene's house stands today. She's not my real grandmother, the boy admitted sadly. I know. I accidentally overheard your conversation when you were walking. She behaved horribly, but the worst part is that she doesn't want to share this wealth with anyone. I'm not her family, I understand her, Alfredo confessed. Alfredo, don't you remember me? Katerina asked. The boy was trying to look closer at her face, but the darkness concealed all features. She took out her phone and illuminated it with a flashlight. Are you Katerina? Marlene's daughter? Alfredo exclaimed so loudly that Katerina hushed him. Quiet, quiet, no one should know about our conversation. After all, you wouldn't want all the money to go to unworthy people who have settled in Marlene's house? Of course, I wouldn't. She's my friend, not theirs. That's why I propose a deal to you, Katerina enthusiastically announced. A deal? What's that? It's an agreement between you and me. You tell me something, and in return, I give you half of this treasure. What can I tell you? The boy asked with interest. You know where they hid this chest, don't you? Actually, no one told me, Alfredo began hesitantly. But one day, I was playing with Pedro, and we accidentally kicked the ball to the second floor. In the bathroom of Dorotea and Leo, there was that chest. They put it in a huge laundry basket that day. It was open, and I saw it there. Excellent. Then it's a deal. You gave me information. Now wait for your reward. There's just one condition. What is it? Don't tell anyone about our conversation, or it won't work out. They shook hands, and a very content Alfredo went home. Katerina also wanted to leave, but heard some rustling in the nearby bushes. She approached closer, listened, but saw nothing. It seemed so, she said, and left. When Dorotea and Leo made sure that no one else was on the lake, they breathed a sigh of relief. Dorotea still tried not to breathe. What the hell was that? Leo finally snapped infuriated by what had just happened. Can't you see? They used the little boy for their selfish purposes, and he, being naive, believed it all. So, she's planning to steal the treasures from us? Her husband insisted. Yes, Leo. We need to urgently go home and tell Marlene everything. And they rushed home, finding Marlene gently rocking the child. She looked at their alarmed faces with confusion. The couple was in a state of panic. What happened? The woman asked in surprise, covering the child with a blanket. He finally fell asleep. Dorotea and Leo recounted everything they had seen and heard. Marlene nearly had a heart attack. She understood that her daughter was quite a character, but not to this extent. They discussed everything for a long time and tried to come up with a plan. In the end, Leo spoke up. Okay, that's it. I have a plan. They didn't know when the robbery was supposed to happen, but something told them that Katerina wouldn't delay it. And they were right. The next night, they noticed her crawling in camouflage near their house. She thought it was an excellent disguise, but she was very wrong. In the evening, all family members took their positions. Katerina snuck into their house through an open window, thinking it was the owner's carelessness. However, even this detail was well thought out by them. Everything was done to lure her into a trap. The woman believed the naive Alfredo and went into the bathroom, although she turned out to be no less naive than the boy. The bathroom was located opposite some doors, and she assumed it was someone's bedroom. It might be Leo and Dorotea's room, so the woman stealthily crept into the bathroom and started looking for a large laundry basket. She didn't have to search for long. But what fools, thought Katerina, to hide such valuable things so carelessly. Suddenly, she heard a sound in the corridor, as if something not very heavy had fallen. She turned around, listened, but didn't see anyone, so she returned to her business. Carefully and silently, she pulled out the box with jewels. 
Not as big as they claimed, she thought, but upon opening it, she realized how bad it was. This chest was a fake. It contained only children's trinkets. She almost screamed in disappointment. Then the bathroom door slammed shut behind her, and she heard footsteps and shouts, Call the police. She's trapped. Katerina tried to open the door, but it seemed they had wedged something like a mop into the handle, blocking the passage. And Katerina was indeed trapped. There were no windows in the bathroom, and there was nowhere to escape. She realized that this was a real defeat. She had nothing left but to wait for the police to arrive. The door opened half an hour later. During this time, no one spoke to her, and she couldn't hear any conversations outside. Everyone spoke in whispers. It infuriated her tremendously. As soon as the door opened, a burly man in a police uniform greeted her. He immediately ordered her to turn around. She didn't resist, and she complied. Handcuffs were placed on her wrists. The man uttered the most cliché phrase she had heard a million times in movies. You're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Come with me. As she walked out of the bathroom, she made eye contact with Dorotea. She was beaming with joy at the fact that their plan had succeeded. Katerina, on the other hand, was terribly angry. She didn't expect these people to be so resourceful. And the plan was very simple. Leo and Dorotea stayed in their bedroom until Marlene, who was standing in the adjacent toilet, closed the door, signaling by stomping her foot. Immediately, Leo burst out of the room and slammed the door to the bathroom. The plan worked out. Katerina was put into a barred car, and the family followed. They were all heading to the police station. Why did you break into someone else's house? Asked a serious man in the interrogation room. Katerina had never been in such a room. To some extent, she was even curious about how these things were done in another situation, of course. Of course, I refuse to speak without my lawyer, Katerina replied indifferently. Do you want to take this matter to court? Then I will tell you what the outcome will be. You will not only pay a fine, but you may also end up behind bars. Maybe during the investigation, some of your dark deeds will come to light. Is that what you want? What do you know about my past? Katerina asked him suspiciously. Of course, it was a cheap manipulation. She wanted to change the subject. Either you answer the question or you stay in custody until the trial, the investigator pressed her. I wanted to take things from my mother's house, and she said that I'm not her daughter. You see, she was very offended. Of course, it hurt me, and I decided to take back at least what belonged to me. All right, the investigator concluded after a minute of silence. He stood up and left the interrogation room. Then, two policemen came in and escorted her behind bars. She tried to break free, but it didn't work. Now it was Marlene and her family's turn. They asked to be interrogated together, as they didn't hide anything from each other. So, you knew that she would break into your house? The man in glasses asked. Yes, that's why we were prepared for the attack, Dorotea answered. Why didn't you call the police immediately when you first suspected something? Because, sorry to say this, but the police in our country work a bit strangely. If we had called you in advance, she would have been scared off, and she would have committed the theft on another day. Then we would definitely not have caught her in the act, Leo sarcastically replied. But she didn't steal anything from you. Right? The investigator asked. No, but there was still a break-in. She trespassed on private property, Marlene replied. She said she wanted to take personal belongings because she was upset with her mother. Is that true? They all exchanged glances and surprise froze on their faces. No, Leo finally answered. That's a blatant lie. In that case, what did she want to steal from you? The investigator inquired. They all exchanged glances again. It was as if they were communicating silently and Dorotea gave Leo a meaningful nod. We'd better show and document this, the guy said uncertainly. In what way? The man was surprised. 
These are historical treasures that, according to the law, should be seized by the state, Leo finally confessed. At that moment, he felt relief, and it seemed like everyone in the room felt the same. Maybe it was for the best, they would get rid of something that added so much complexity to their lives. The slightly surprised investigator agreed with them and went to their house. Leo briefly told him the backstory of where they found this chest, how they found it, and why they were doing it. Then he talked about Katerina, who first sold her mother's house and then threatened to take it back along with the plot. And, finally, they reached the subject of all the disputes and disagreements, the chest, which was hidden right under Leo and Dorothea's bed. Well, the policeman began inspecting the contents of the chest, we need to examine it, and if its historical value is confirmed, then you will deal with it there. I have to confiscate it and hand it over to the appropriate authorities. Everyone agreed with this, and the chest was confiscated. The conflict with Katerina was resolved, she was fined for minor domestic hooliganism and released. And so, it seemed like this story finally ended, but the next day Alfredo showed up at their house. He was crying bitterly and couldn't stop. Marlene tried to comfort the poor boy for a long time, not understanding what had upset him so much. She treated him to various candies and gave him coffee. Finally, Alfredo managed to calm down a bit and tell what had been bothering him. I'm sorry, Grandma Marlene, he cried on her lap. Forgive me. I am so guilty. What are you talking about? What are you sorry for? The woman reassured him. I told your bad daughter where you hide that cursed chest. All the troubles because of it. But we've already settled everything, sunshine. Alfredo, what's wrong? I'm so guilty. I quarreled with you and betrayed you right away. I'm a terrible friend. I'm guilty too in that case. I shouldn't have refused you so abruptly. We're all guilty, but the most important thing is that we can admit our mistakes. We learn from them, that's the main thing. Grandma, I love you so much. The following months went wonderfully. Summer was coming to an end. Alfredo was getting ready for the second grade, and Pedro was finally going to daycare. The historical expertise confirmed that the chest and its contents were a historical treasure, so now they belonged to the state. However, they were paid a good sum for the found treasure. Leo was promoted at work. Now they could afford to buy a spacious family car. Alfredo's parents became good friends with Dorotea and Leo, forming a wonderful friendship between the two families. They invited each other to picnics, birthdays, and celebrations. These two families became very close. Marlene no longer spent the entire year alone in the remote village. Dorotea and Leo allocated a separate room for her in their apartment. Grandma Marlene also lived with them in the winter and took care of the child while the young parents went to friends or to the cinema. And when everyone was at work and Pedro was in daycare, Marlene could enjoy a previously unknown city social life. She visited libraries, parks, and museums, socialized with peers, and even took up power walking with a group of like-minded people. There had been no news of Katerina for a long time. Where did she go? What happened to her? How were her children doing? Was she still married? Marlene didn't know and almost didn't care anymore. Katerina had chosen her own path. No one forced her to abandon her mother. Of course, initially, it was difficult for Marlene to accept this, but she understood that it had always been a one-sided love. Katerina has never loved her mother since her early childhood. She was a cruel and cynical person. A year passed. Summer came again to the city. All the ghosts of the past gradually faded into the family's memory. Now they sought to maintain relationships and help each other every day. Marlene mainly assisted with cooking and taking care of the child, offering various advice but not imposing it. Parents had to decide how to raise their children on their own. Pedro loved her very much. Of course, he was still very young, but he had long been saying the word grandma. Marlene was very pleased with that. Relationships with Alfredo were also improving. He became more understanding and serious. He finished only the second grade, but already felt like a great scholar. 
He especially liked mathematics. This exact science attracted him more than anything. With the help of mathematics, I can explain a lot, he said. They told me that when I grow up, I'll be able to study physics, chemistry, and geometry. I'm really looking forward to that. The families, as usual, went to the lake, had picnics, and, of course, swam in the pool. Only now the idea of searching for treasures was no longer so important to them. Perhaps there was still something hidden here, but they had enough of the story that happened last year. But one night, this family idol was disrupted again. The clock showed around three in the morning. Everyone was fast asleep. Marlene was resting in her separate house, and Pedro and his parents were in their bedroom. Suddenly, Dorotea heard some noise downstairs. She tried to wake up her husband, but he was sleeping soundly. So, she put on her robe and slowly went downstairs. She was terribly scared, especially since she had seen a lot of horror movies where maniacs or ghosts attacked their victims. But this time, the movies were right, and her intuition did not fail her. Dorotea went down the stairs and looked down. There, she saw two people in black masks. Her heart sank, real robbers, she needed to raise the alarm. First of all, she decided to wake up her husband. She turned, but the floorboard beneath her betrayed her with a creak. The girl stopped, and flashlights were immediately directed at her. Dorotea realized they had seen her. She slowly raised her hands and began turning around just as slowly. Two gun barrels were pointed at her, and each could shoot at any moment. Come down, hissed a male voice from under the mask. Dorotea decided not to tempt fate and began to descend the stairs slowly. Tremors ran through her, and her husband, unfortunately, remained oblivious to it all. When she descended, she accidentally bumped into a vase, which shattered into pieces. It was supposed to make a noise and attract Leo's attention. But there was only silence from all sides. The masked robber took a wooden chair and placed it in the center of the room. Sit down, he ordered. The girl obeyed. As soon as she sat down, he forcefully pressed her against the back of the chair, and his partner started tying Dorotea with a rope. Where's your husband? The rough voice asked again. In the bedroom on the second floor, Dorotea squeaked quietly like a mouse. After these words, her mouth was taped shut. She tried to say something else, but now only incoherent sounds came out. She cried out of despair and didn't know what to do. Meanwhile, the robber went upstairs and forcefully pulled Leo off the bed. The guy was still sleepy, so he didn't immediately realize what was happening, but the thief didn't want to take any risks. He immediately knocked the homeowner out with a heavy butt of a gun. Leo collapsed to the floor. The muscular robber in the mask easily lifted the guy and laid him over his shoulder. He brought him downstairs and seated him next to the girl, who was wriggling and trying to escape. Their chairs were tied in such a way that only their backs touched. They couldn't even look at each other. After about five minutes, Leo came to his senses, although there was no longer any point in that. He was as immobilized as Dorotea, with his mouth taped shut. Well, finally, you both woke up, said a familiar female voice. Dorotea couldn't understand where she had heard it, but when the woman took off her mask, everything fell into place. It was Katerina again. Her partner didn't bother removing the mask, probably not wanting to reveal his identity. Tell me where the chest is, she ordered the two, indifferent, while pointing the gun at them. Dorotea just mumbled. Katerina thought she wanted to say something, so she signaled her partner to remove the tape. But instead of revealing the location of the treasure, Dorotea blurted out, You'll burn in hell, you monster. After these words, they immediately taped her mouth again, giving her a slap for good measure. Now, you, Katerina interrogated Leo, circling around him, Do you also have something clever to say, like your wife? He shook his head from side to side, trying to free himself. So, you're all going to remain silent. Am I right? Katerina asked rhetorically in a disdainful tone. Well, then I'll have to motivate you in other ways. She nodded to her accomplice, and he went upstairs. 
Dorotea immediately guessed why he went there, or rather, who he went after. She began to struggle, break free, and shake the chair, but it was all in vain. When Katerina's partner returned with their son, Dorotea almost lost consciousness. Tears streamed from her eyes. The robber held her son by the hand, and he swayed in and out of sleep, constantly on the verge of falling. The man sat him on the couch. Thankfully, Pedro was too sleepy to understand what was happening. He just laid down on the sofa and continued sleeping. Katerina approached Dorotea even closer, face to face, and whispered, Oh, what is it? Are you crying? Yes, mothers should cry when their child is in danger. She pointed the gun at Pedro, the defenseless child, who peacefully slept on the couch. Dorotea trembled. She screamed with all her might, but it only came out as a plaintive moan. Tears flowed like a river. Katerina approached her again, ripped off the tape, and Dorotea experienced unbearable pain, but she didn't waste time and screamed. Don't you dare touch him. Her mouth was immediately taped shut again, but now Dorotea hoped that someone would hear her screams. And indeed, Marlene woke up from her deep sleep, hearing the piercing scream. At first, she thought it was only her imagination. To be sure, she looked out the window, which faced directly onto Dorotea and Leo's house, and noticed an unnatural blue light in one of the windows. Something happened, flashed in her mind. She put on her robe and, passing by the shed, took a shovel just in case. She quietly approached the house and cautiously opened the door. Before her, there was a monstrous scene. Dorotea and Leo were sitting tied up. Dorotea was sobbing, and Leo was trying to free himself from the ropes. Her daughter was here again. She and her accomplice threatened to kill little Pedro, pointing a gun at him if the parents didn't reveal the location of the chest. In horror, without thinking about what she was doing, Marlene ran up to Katerina and gave her the strongest slap in her life. Katerina even staggered from the unexpectedness. What are you doing, you devil? Marlene shouted. Get out of here and don't interfere, Katerina retorted and continued pressing Dorotea. Your child will die because of your selfishness. Is that what you want? Come to your senses. You're committing a crime. There are no more treasures here. Oh yes, sure, Katerina smirked. Throughout this time, her accomplice was standing with a gun aimed at the child. Marlene, realizing the direness of the situation, grabbed the shovel she had brought and, with all her strength, hit the bandit on the head. She missed slightly, but still managed to hit the edge. The man, out of surprise and pain, instinctively started shooting. Marlene immediately rushed to Pedro, shielding him with her body. One bullet hit the ceiling, and the other went straight into Katerina's heart. She looked in horror at her partner and, a second later, collapsed to the floor. She didn't even have time to say anything. Her breath stopped immediately, and her heart ceased to beat. Seizing the opportunity, Leo finally freed himself from the ropes and twisted the bandit's hands behind his back. Call the police! He shouted to Marlene. She did everything exactly as instructed. The police didn't take long to arrive, but Leo had already managed to tie the bandit's hands, seat him on the couch, and point a gun at him. Meanwhile, Dorotea took her son upstairs and kissed him for a long time. Everything's fine, my love, everything's fine, she said to him, hugging him as tightly as possible. The police burst into the house with their weapons and ordered everyone to raise their hands and surrender. The bandit attempted to escape, but he failed. I never knew you were such a fighter, Marlene, Leo joked when they took away the criminal and Katerina's body. Marlene was sitting on the couch, neither alive nor dead. They were asking her something, but she couldn't understand and couldn't answer. Her heart was under tremendous pressure. Realizing that she felt unwell, they called an ambulance just in time. In the clinic, they said she had had a heart attack. Marlene woke up the next day. She saw a white room, a white ceiling, and a nurse who had injected something into her vein. Your relatives will come to you soon, she informed and left. A few minutes later, Dorotea, Leo, 
and Pedro on her arms, Alfredo and his parents burst into the room. All of them were very concerned. Alfredo brought wildflowers, Pedro brought a balloon, and Dorotea brought Marlene her favorite raspberry jam, which she had made herself. Is all of this for me? The woman wondered. Yes, for you, Grandma Marlene, Alfredo exclaimed, hugging Marlene. We are so glad you're feeling better. We were terribly worried about you, said Dorotea. Oh, you shouldn't have, Marlene blushed in embarrassment. Marlene spent another week in the hospital. Every day someone visited her, Leo with Dorotea, Alfredo with his parents, who shared news about everything happening in the world. Oh, and when you come back, we'll throw you a cool party, he announced. It's a secret, though. Oh, you chatterbox, Marlene jokingly scolded him. When she was discharged, she needed to use a wheelchair for an entire month. But it was not a problem, as they now had a large car that could accommodate anything. Finally, they brought her back to her home. Leo unloaded the wheelchair, placed Marlene in it, and drove her into the house. As soon as the door opened, the lights came on, and inflatable balloons floated to the ceiling. Everyone stood with gifts and a cake, shouting in unison. Surprise! Marlene warmly thanked everyone and sat down at the table. As she explored the house, memories of the past night cut through her consciousness like a knife. Her daughter had died, and she hadn't even felt anything. She felt bitter and ashamed of her indifference to her daughter's death. However, she was terribly frightened for the fate of Dorotea and her son Pedro, who had narrowly escaped death. Perhaps her true love now lay in them? By the end of the evening, Marlene was informed that her daughter's accomplice had received several years of imprisonment. So, in the twilight of her years, Marlene found a really loving family. They valued, respected, and loved her until the end of her days. Dorotea became like a daughter to Marlene. She devotedly cared for her, even when Marlene became bedridden. But she still had a whole ten years of productive and happy life ahead of her. Dorotea and her husband always remained sensitive and understanding. And when someone said that, legally, they were not a real family and couldn't be considered one, Marlene just smiled in response, as a true family is not only those connected by blood, but also those who love, respect, and care for each other. For kinship is not only in blood, but also in the call of the heart. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.